Right now, to think of Guillermo del Toro is to think about a successful figure and an example to follow. But he wasn't always like that. In his beginnings, he was considered a freak, especially by his own family, who even sent him for an exorcism to cure him. And even, incredibly, his own country turned its back on him, despite the fact he put them all on high. But even with all those tragedies, he continues to give us more of his art with a smile, regardless of the terrible past he has had. Now, let's remember and learn about the sad life of Guillermo del Toro. Born on October 9, 1964 in Guadalajara, Jalisco, Guillermo was misunderstood in the eyes of his family, but especially in the eyes of his father. His father was a used car salesman. He didn't understand why little Guillermo liked the Frankenstein movie so much, apart from the comics about monsters. And it is something that surely wasn't to the taste of his family, who were very devout Catholics. It seems like something that any child could like, but in Guillermo's case, it was all for the worse. His grandmother wanted to exorcise him, and not once, but twice, and all because he felt a great fascination for monsters and creatures that he used to draw in a notebook. So his grandmother wanted to fix him with a couple of exorcisms, and also threw holy water on him from time to time. Maybe that's why in his films religious figures are always a little scary. And in Pan's Labyrinth and Pinocchio is where he makes a more direct criticism to the Catholic Church. But for poor Guillermo, this wasn't the worst. As a child, he saw real corpses of people who were shot to death or had car accidents, which he has said helped him understand how life is not so colorful, not when you live in Mexico. These events helped him to blend the concepts of life and death into one, very profound things for a little boy of 10 years old. It seemed that Guillermo's life was going from bad to worse, but the most heartbreaking event he experienced was when his father was kidnapped. The criminals believed that Guillermo was rich, and asked for a lot of money to pay for his liberty. Unfortunately, the country didn't help Guillermo with anything, but miraculously, his father was saved, thanks to James Cameron, yes, the famous director who gave Guillermo the money. At the time, Guillermo was already a director, but unfortunately, he didn't have the money, since he had made an investment previously. Making a good friend, Cameron offered him one million dollars so they could free his father. It seemed that all his life after this couldn't get any worse. Until… he was exiled from his own country? At least involuntarily. After his father's kidnapping, it was no longer safe for him to stay in Mexico. This causes him much sadness to this day. Some think that Guillermo has some kind of curse, given his terrible origins as a child, and that this curse followed him into his career as a director. And the proof of this is when he lost the original script of Pan's Labyrinth. And it was just bad luck. In London, he forgot in the back of a cab the notebook where everything about the story was. He moved heaven and earth to get it back, but he didn't manage to do it. At least not on his own, since this cab driver found it and looked for Guillermo to return it. Thank God! And I think most of us know about this director, but not many know that his success took a lot of years. He admits that in his early 20s, he already felt that he wasn't going to achieve anything in his life. Everything he produces takes years in his hands before it's shown to the public. The clearest examples are, it took him 5 years for Pan's Labyrinth, and up to 15 years for Pinocchio. In addition, he failed many, many times and still continues to do so. He has had many good projects cancelled, such as a Silent Hill game and an adaptation of Mountains of Madness, a horror story by H.P. Lovecraft. Another tragic event that changed his life was when he lost his father. After being in the hospital for a week, his father passed away. Many thought that it was Guillermo himself who was in poor health, 
But no, it was all a very stressful family situation, while Guillermo del Toro was turning 58 years old. Guillermo also left The Hobbit at a very advanced stage of production due to many personal problems he faced, and he defined this as one of the worst times of his life. He never gave details about this, but The Hobbit team understood. And in fact, we can find his name in the credits of the movie as a way of thanking him. And even though we all know his name, Guillermo has only made one film, in his words. Although they are all different, they are all part of a single one that tells a great story. His story and all those monsters so different and cool are just his version of how the world looks through his eyes. Guillermo, because of the past he had, he's always going to defend anything that is weird, since he identifies a lot with those accusations that were made to him as a child, mentioning that every flaw is a virtue badly looked at. And it is because of these things that Del Toro identified with Hellboy, a character he made a movie for, since he's a demon that does good things questioning religion. Make peace with failure is one of his modus and the one he applies whenever he can, because according to him, success can make you lose yourself. That is, success can make you lose yourself, but failure will always teach you something important and remind you not to give up. His words are more motivating than the inspirational Tweety Bird images in family groups. Really? The fun of Pond's Labyrinth did exist, and they made a pact. He appeared to Guillermo when he was a child, and according to him, he once had a lucid dream, where he saw a fun coming out from behind his watch, and saw monsters walking along a carpet in the hallway. He had to pass through there to go to the bathroom, and then he offered them a deal. They would let him pass and, in exchange, he would be friends with them forever. This experience marked him, and it can be said that he kept his part of this brigade, since he dedicated his life to introduce to us all those monstrous friends. Guillermo learned English on his own at a young age, just to be able to read more stories in magazines that talked about monsters. He became a fan of all kinds of stories, especially Godzilla and Astro Boy. In one of these magazines, he was able to learn a little about makeup. And so, he started to simulate some scars with which he could scare his first victim, his babysitter. He also studied at a public university, specifically at the University of Guadalajara, at the Center for Research and Film Studies, where he offered courses and was even a professor, and the university also supported him in the launching of his career. We will no longer complain about being in public school. If he could, we all can. He was inspired by The Exorcist, perfected his skills with makeup, and was a supervisor in this area for 10 years. He even worked with the man in charge of doing this makeup, Dick Smith. Later, they became mentor and student, and even friends. Then he even founded his own production company, Necropia, and around that time, he also produced and directed some Mexican television programs, such as The Marked Hour of Televisa. His first breakthrough project was Kronos, where he put those fantasy elements he liked so much, and brought in for the first time the actor with whom he made a lot of good movies, Ron Perlman. This movie won nine Ariel Awards, Mexico's version of the Oscars. Stephen King was impressed when he saw Mimic, the first Hollywood movie Guillermo del Toro made. In his words, it was original and terrifying. He didn't like Hollywood, at least at first. When he made Mimic, he found it too demanding and preferred to return to Mexico to form another production company, the Tequila Gang. For names, he is very original. He began to define his style in the film The Devil's Backbone, where we see for the first time a child protagonist and the consequences of war, points that he would repeat many times in other films. Besides adding a lot of fantasy, since he says that his style is not horror, but a fantasy with dark touches. That's why we can see that The Devil's Backbone, Pan's Labyrinth, and more recently Pinocchio have very similar stories. 
And tell me guys, did you know all these facts about the Experience Director? Which one surprised you the most?